So swivel your chairs, come on a little bit forward, join us. Um, Jonah, we have a short amount of time. I want to start with a big <clears throat> question. It has recently been reported, uh, and by Disney, in fact, uh, that Disney attempted to acquire you. You haven't said much about that. Um, why did you say no to Disney? Um, so I think the, the real question, people ask why companies turn down offers, but the real question is like, why would you take an offer? Um, the company is growing, um, we're profitable. You know, we're not in a situation where we're, we have a lot of scale, but we're not making any money, and so we need, a, you know, need deep pockets in order to, to sustain the company. We're all having a tremendous amount of fun, and we're very excited about what we're going to do in the next five years. And so we have a very long-term vision, and, and, and so staying independent seemed like the, the, the best path for us. So that makes a lot of sense, Jonah. Um, but you certainly must have been asking why, why you, should, you should consider it, because as I understand it, you, know, you got pretty far along the way in the talks. So can you share, us, share with us anything about the process? Um, I think that you know, um, Bob Iger is a very impressive guy, and, and I enjoy talking to him. And you know, if, if someone can convince Steve Jobs to sell Pixar or George Lucas to sell Lucas Films, they're like worth having dinner with. And um, the, you know, they're, they're a very impressive company that's sure. done a lot of amazing things. And you know, the, the price that was reported but never confirmed was close to a billion dollars. I've heard it was a little bit less than that. Can, can you confirm that? No. <laughs> We're all friends here. Right? Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed purports to be. Uh, you're building a next generation media company. What is a media company in 2014 and beyond? So there's these massive trends that when we started BuzzFeed were small. Yeah. Um, social was not the way people got their content when we first started BuzzFeed. And history. When did you first start BuzzFeed? What year are we? We, we were a lab in 2008 with, in, with a little office in Chinatown. We didn't really have a business, but we were experimenting with content. I was obsessed with why, do, why does content spread? How do ideas spread? Sure. Um, you know, I had this experience when I was a grad student of accidentally having something go viral, and I was, I was trying to understand how it was possible to reach millions of people without owning a printing press or a broadcast pipe. So that seemed different and new. And so BuzzFeed was a lab to really, really try to understand that. And, and as, we, as we started to experiment, we started to figure things out. And then it started to grow and become more, more and more of, of a company. And social and mobile were really not big trends at the time. People weren't consuming content on mobile devices very much. And they weren't um, consuming content through through sharing, it was mostly through search and portals. Right. And what, what happened was we were building this niche media company for, for sort of social, and then social and mobile converged, and it became the dominant way that people consume news and entertainment. And, and you see that people's phones have become, you know, now it's like a cliche. Every kind of conference, people get together and say, the phone is really important. And, you know, it, 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 it were like people were saying that for a while, and it wasn't true. You know, like you look at stats on, of content consumption, and even though people knew it was coming, it didn't. It wasn't actually true. Now it's totally, totally true. More than half our traffic is coming from mobile, um, and and you're you're really seeing that you can build a different kind of media company that doesn't rely on industrial era media distribution technology. So, what does that different kind of media company look like? How is it staffed? Who is it serving? And what? How is it serving them? So, the one big difference is you have a lot more data about how people are consuming content so you can serve the consumer better because you you actually um, can see if people really love something you can see what they how they, they comment on it they share it they interact with it so um, lots of real-time data feedback that allows a team of really creative people and great reporters and people who make entertainment content to do a better job of, of making things that people really love Right. Um, so that's a huge advantage, and I think that traditionally, you know, you, you, media companies are op operate more like um, like, like they're um, in the in the wholesale business, where they make a show and then they sell it to every single possible window they can sell it to. Right. And we're much more um, um, combining the medium with the content to make things that really feel at home on all the different platforms that are emerging now, and getting data back about how it works. You know, it seems like every forward-thinking um, media company also purports to be, and has through history, purported to be a technology company. But there's an inherent tension between the two. So at the end of the day, is, is BuzzFeed a media company, or is it a technology company? Um, we're, we're a media company, but, but in the beginning of a new era of media, uh, technology is more important. So when, when um, Henry Luce launched Life magazine, it was wasn't that nobody had an idea for a magazine with big pictures. It was that it was impossible to print big, beautiful pictures um, in a mass-produced way. And so as soon as printing press technology got to the point where you could print 
glossy color photos on cheap paper, right. um, you know, life was possible. And it was still hard. When they first launched, it was expensive and it was difficult. And they got it off the ground and it quickly became bigger than time. And it was, it was because uh, the technology had progressed. And so to be a good media company in the beginning of an era, you need to have a really good understanding of, of, of technology and you need to, 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 to be expert in technology. And then when, uh, when, when things mature more, um, the, the technolo technology aspect be becomes more stable and, so, and more commoditized. Um, but right now, being, you can't really build a big media company unless you're great at technology. So you, know, you guys have <coughs> put real effort and resources into uh, political investigative reporting. I'm curious, uh, how does that go over with readers? Is it being read? Yeah, it's being, it's being read a, a tremendous amount. I mean, I think sometimes people look at these things in relative terms and they say, you know, BuzzFeed's quiz on which city should you actually live on in got, you know, uh, more views than a political report. But if you look in, in the numbers of uh, the absolute numbers, you know, we have a long form story, a million and a half people read, um, average time on mobile, 22 minutes. You know, people are, people are reading this content, you know, more than, than ever before. And so how, how important is it to your overall strategy? And why is it important to your overall strategy? Um, our basic thesis is that, is that um, the media industry is in, ma in rapid transition and that people still have enduring human needs. They want to be informed. They want to be entertained. They want to be inspired. And, and if you can build a, a digital, social, mobile kind of company that is making content for, for that, that serves those basic human needs, you're going to be able to build a, build a big company. And that there, it, it's not like there's any of the things that have mattered in the history of media that people don't want anymore. It's just right. they want it delivered in a different way. People are consuming it in a different way. And, and, and so that's really what we're focused on. So uh, BuzzFeed published the New York Times Innovation report. Um, so congratulations, that was a great get. Um, so you must have read it, and I'm curious what you think of the, the various strategies that were laid out in it. Uh, it, I mean, it was, a, it was a, a really interesting read. It had a lot of interesting ideas in it. I think um, they were a little too hard on themselves. Um, you know, it's not that the challenge for the New York Times is that they need this feature or that feature that some web competitor has. You know, the challenge is is the platform shift from print to digital. And, right. and so I feel like if I was writing an innovation report for the New York Times, like it would almost entirely be about that. It wouldn't be like, our website should have this feature or that feature. It would be like, OK, there's this massive shift. Most of our revenue and, 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 you know, is coming from print. And most of our distribution is now shifting to digital. And like, how do we solve this, this problem and, and figure out you know, um, business models for this new world we're entering. So as legacy media companies in particular try to solve exactly that problem, so often you hear the refrain, well, let's make it more like BuzzFeed. How does BuzzFeed do that? Um, so I'm curious, I must come, come to you with that question. Um, how do legacy media companies, what can they learn from you? And what really doesn't apply? So I think one big mistake people make across all of business is that they want to be what they're not. Like there's this natural tendency to get obsessed with com competition and then just to want to be what you're not. So like if you are in the television business, you want to be online and be cool and webby. And if you're if you're cool and webby, you're like I want to like produce original shows or I want to you know right. buy buy original shows. Um, and, and so there's this, there's this natural tendency to kind of get thrown off what you're actually good at and to focus on where other people are having success. And I think that actually is not a good strategy. Like I think copying BuzzFeed um, in general is not a good strategy. The best way to, 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 uh, to succeed, I think, is to think, what are you really good at? How do you extend that in new directions or push that in new areas? And oftentimes when you actually look at companies getting, you know, Companies that successfully compete, it's it's doing something on the flanks. It's not doing what the what their competitor is doing. Right. I want to bring our audience in early here. Does anybody want to be the inaugural question out there? Okay, Megan. Hi, I'm Megan McCarthy with Fortune, and I actually uh, there's uh, an article in Gawker that was posted I think yesterday um, talking about how. Uh, it's some of the earlier BuzzFeed posts, uh, you ended up kind of revisiting them and they didn't stand up to your editorial standards, so you ended up taking them down off the web. I have sort of two questions to that. One, uh, what are the standards uh, and how have they sort of changed over time? And secondly, do you feel like your content is something that is uh, kind of on the record for history or do you feel like it's much more ephemeral and it's just for the moment right now? Yeah, so um, I think that 
that really the early days of BuzzFeed when I was, I was still at Huffington Post, it, we, were, we were really operating like a lab. And it was a lab to try to understand how people engage with content and how, how people, um, um, you know, where, where we weren't even thinking of our editorial team as editors. They were like stunt pilots or something, you know? And so some of the content from that era was like, it, you know, maybe trolly or sloppily sourced or, or, or like not something that we would ever do today. And so if an editor, you know, is like, oh, I did something in, you know, like about four years ago, um, before Ben Smith joined, before we had, you know, a copy editing desk and a style manual and a, and a you know, team of reporters, um, you know, th you know that, that someone finds randomly and is like, whoa, what is this? I can't believe BuzzFeed did this, because that happens on the web, right? People stumble onto something and don't realize it's, you know, four years old. It was really almost like the product of a, of a different company. It was like before our pivot, you know? So, so, so that, that's really what that was about. You know, before we, before we pivoted into being a journalistic organization as well as an entertainment company, um, and before we pivoted from being a lab to being a company that makes professional content, there were some just like sloppy things. Anybody else out there? Okay, then I'm gonna jump in and ask about your current big growth areas. Both geographies and yeah. So the biggest, um, and I'm like realizing when the lights go up that like everyone's over there. They're, they're way um, back there. So, so um, I don't know if you were asking questions. I thought I was like in a little living room with just a few of my <laughs> closest friends. Um, so uh, which brings us back to the Disney acquisition. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, growth. Uh, growth. Yeah. So so the biggest, really, the biggest shift in our business has been video. So. Uh, 18 months ago, we didn't, have, we didn't have a video business. We acquired Zay Frank's company. Um, Zay is one of the early pioneers in web video. Um, an interesting thing about Zay is that you know, back in 2001, Zay was also doing these little experiments on the web, so that's how I met him. We were you know, really, really um, both trying to understand like, how the web worked and how content on the web worked, and there was no money in it, and it wasn't something that anyone the, really the way the media industry worked, but we learned lots of things and evolved over the years. And now um, Zay is, has a studio lot in LA that, you know, for BuzzFeed Video that is doing over 200 million video views a month and doing amazing branded content. And um, that's an area where, where it's really like, you know, a, a, a huge shift in our business that we have um, a, a massive video, video uh, business now. So video, I know you, you launched business. How is business done? The business vertical? Yeah. It's done well. I mean, it's, uh, we do our BuzzFeed Brew series with a lot of great interviews. Um, we, we've broken stories and scoops, and you know, it's, it's been a good part of the mix. In some cases, um, you know, business doesn't get shared as widely, um, as you may know. I don't know. Um, uh, but it's Not on Fortune.com. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> but the people who care about it really care deeply about it, and, and, and so um, you know, we've done some some great reporting on Ab Abercrombie and Fitch. We've done some great reporting on on, um, on American Apparel. Um, so, um, you know, and, and and in some cases, like taking an earnings report that shows the that you know a, a brand talks about their customers as being like homeless chic, you know, right. in their earnings reports, and then the and their people who are their customers don't even know that they're being talked like about that behind their back. But when that's in a BuzzFeed story, people are like, what? That's how they market to us? And um, so there's, there, part, some of it is, you know, we're exposing business reporting to, to a younger audience too, which is pretty cool. And the, the business of BuzzFeed is really native advertising. Yes. So what do you see as the potential for native advertising and the growth of native advertising? Do you see this as something that will continue to grow or are we in a little bit of bubble, of bubble and it will pop and you will have to continue to reinvent your business? Well, you always have to continue to reinvent your business, but I, th I think that what we're, the stage we're at now is, is there's finally uh, branded content native advertising is moving out of test budgets into the actual you know, real budgets and are becoming part of the, the plans. Sure. And that's, now there's the scale that there wasn't, that didn't exist before. You know, we're 150 million unique visitors and, and we're growing globally, and that's, which is another big area of growth for us. Like our, our, our uh, UK business is, is really growing rapidly. Australia, um, we're starting in, in, in some other languages as well. Um, and so the scale is allowing pe brands to do branded content and br brand marketing with native at a, at a much bigger scale. So they don't have to just 
just dabble in it and experiment with it. They can do it for real now. Right. Uh, the data is getting better. The practices for doing it are getting better. People, brands are less um, are less nervous about it. They understand it better. So so it, it feels like it's going from the stage of being a shiny thing, shiny new thing, to being uh, one of the core things that brands use in you know to to to, to market. Right. I'm going to give our audience one last chance out here. Okay. Question right back there. Stand up and wait for a mic. Hi there, Michael Chewy from McKinsey. What is it about lists that um, makes them do what they do? Yeah, so lists have a great tradition. Um, you know, the Ten Commandments are a list. Um, <laughs> mo uh, depending on your point of view, that either came from Moses or God, um, or was a complete fabrication. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence is not a list, but the Bill of Rights is a list. I almost got that wrong. Um, but I, th I think there's, there's something about structuring attention um, so that you can kind of jump from item to item. You can skip ones that you're not, that, that, you're, that if you get bored, you know there's another um, piece of it. You get completion at the end of the list. Um, there's some authoritativeness to a list. Why is there 27 items instead of you know, you know, some other number? It's because that's the right number for that. So um, I think that lists are a great way to consume content. You've seen it even extend into explainers and news content and branded content, lots of other areas. Um, so what is it about, what is, what is the definitive best number for a list? You, you referenced 27. Yeah, well, so there's some, there's some logic that, that odd numbers are more common. Mm and debate about that. There was like a... a Did God and Moses not know that? <laughs> well, I mean, maybe it's that there's a lot of, that there is like, uh, uh, ten, 10 became kind of cliche. Fair enough. So then you see a list of 10, you're just like, oh, they just, they just like kept trying, they only had seven, but they kept trying to think of more. Um, there are only so many times you can copy God, too. Before <laughs> well, in what? some of the Ten Commandments, you know, you, it, maybe it should have been seven. Well, they're sort of <laughs> repetitive. They needed an editor. I don't know. <laughs> Last question out there before we close. Okay, right up here, Manny. Oh. Wait for the mic. Hi, my name is Manny Kutiel. I'm chief of staff at Forward.us. Um, recently, I've seen um, more quizzes where you've collected data as to people's views on certain things. Um, the quiz that I took was it rated how much white privilege you had, and you actually had to go through all of your socioeconomic data, your diseases, your, um, you know, your, your income, your family. How did you, how, you, how did you do? I, I don't <laughs> have a lot of white privilege, <laughs> which I think was reassuring, but also a little, I went to really good schools, so I kind of, I questioned that. Anyway, um, I'm wondering, because Forward.us is a political advocacy group, and we're, the, the goal of the group is to, you know, politically engage the tech community, so. Quick kind of a question. Yes, interesting. The question is, what are you, are you planning on doing anything with that demographic data? Anything politically with that data? Do you want to use it for something? Expose what are you going to do with the data? So. Um, Thank you, Manny. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, so, so um, we anonymize all the da data because we, do, you know, obviously people are answering these questions and quizzes and don't want, you know, their individual answers to be, you know, identifiable. So we anonymize it, and then we can look in aggregate to see generally how people are, are, are answering quizzes. And maybe there's some products. I mean, this is essentially what online polls are, which is a quiz where they shows shows the data back to the to the audience. And so we may we may you know do some things like that. Um, but in general, you know, in general we. We, we use the data in aggregate and to, to protect people's privacy. So although there's lots of, of possible uses for that, for marketing or for other things, you know, um, we, we'd rather have peop, our, our consumers feel, you know, our readers feel like they can answer questions and know that their data is safe. It gives them an authenticity and a confidence. Yeah. Yeah. So Jenna, we've heard a lot about the future of a media company, and we've managed to get through our time together without using the word listicle. I want to thank you so much for joining us. All right, thank you.